What is up, everybody? Bryce here from Whitmix. Welcome to Hawaiian Shirt Friday, where we talk about all of your topical, tropical topics. Uh, just kidding. Today we're talking about. <laughs> today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, nesting and and milling um, uh, screw retained restorations in your CAM software, particularly uh, Millbox. And um, like I said, my name's Bryce. Most of you know me, uh, and I am a, a technical specialist here at Whitmix. And I am joined by Evan Kemper. Uh, Evan, you want to give everybody hey. a little bit of a rundown on who you are? Yep. So anybody who hasn't been on a previous one, um, I'm Evan Kemper. I'm an application engineer here at Whitmix. I'm also a certified dental technician in Crown and Bridge. Uh, so my day-to-day -day is fairly similar to Bryce's, but with some um, internal software development and um, 3D printed R&D uh, engineering projects. Um, so like Bryce said, today we're going to be talking about um, screw retained crowns, uh, particularly on um, hybrid tie bases and millbox and some considerations to take into account when you're nesting um, and importing these as well as um, on the hardware side, what you would actually need to be able to mill them. So I'm going to go ahead and open up millbox. Um, and for anybody who's not completely familiar with it. It's a um, basically a updated user interface for uh, some 3D. Um, it also adds some additional features on top of that, um, but it also simplifies the workflow and the uh, kind of the uh, graphical user interface so that it's a little bit more um, palatable, I guess, compared to what it, it used to be. So a great improvement on uh, Sim Systems part. Um, and one thing um, actually that you didn't see since I already had this open, if I open this up, if you're on the latest 2019 version, and I believe they added it to the 2018 as well, but you get this splash screen. And if I open that back up, yeah, one second, then um, it brings up kind of the change log uh, for the kind of core version of Millbox. Um, so some of these uh, updates will be coming down the road um, in the 2020 version of the DG shape, which is what we have uh, for the Roland Mills. But also there's a real nice video linked over here that Mike Webb did on this pretty much the exact same topic. Um, so, you know, you can either come back and reference this webinar or you can just, if you have Millbox, click this pop up and that'll take you right to the YouTube page where you can see um, Mike's uh, video that he did on this. Nice. Uh, if anybody has questions at any point during this, uh, feel free to type those into the questions box. We're going to be answering those as we go along. Um, so feel free to get those in. Uh, also, really quickly before we actually dive in, this is going to be recorded. So if you want to come back and watch this, uh, you can do that. So um, just go back to the page where you registered for this uh, webinar. And um, probably, to, I, I would imagine probably tomorrow, it'll be uploaded and you'll be able to go back and watch it free of charge. Yep. All right, so uh, just a little general overview of Millbox. Your main workflow will be top to bottom on the right. Uh, so each one of these steps you perform and it'll actually auto progress you through as you complete them. Uh, you have some additional advanced tools under the tools section. Um, under job management, this lets you go back and look at old jobs. Um, so we're gonna start just by clicking new job. And then right now I only have the DWX50 and the 52 DCI set up in here. Um, also, we do have a uh, basically a tool patch that uh, we can put into Millbox that separates the tools out uh, based on material. Um, so that is something that even if uh, you have, you know, just the base version of Millbox where you're having to swap tools between materials, um, we can't put this in. There's a fee to it, um, but if you if you want your tools separated out like that, then we can do it for you. Um, so I'm just going to pick that tool package and the 52 DCI. Then I'm going to pick zirconia if we're going to mill this in a, as a hybrid in zirconia. And then I'll pick the fixture, which I'm going to use the puck, not the pin mounted zirconia option. Next, that's going to bring me into my STL import. And so I'm going to browse onto our technical drive, STLs. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we go, webinar. So <clears throat> I have a screw retain crown. This is the is a full contour crown that we did earlier in the week. 
if I left click on it down here, I can actually pop up a 3D view. So full contour and it is set up for a tie base. So the next thing I'm going to do is just select the type. So basically anything that you're importing that was designed for a tie base or has a screw hole through it um, that doesn't have basically the actual engaging part that would index into the implant, you're going to import as a hybrid abutment. So then I'm just going to hit the plus because I'm actually going to import a couple of these. And that's going to start the import of that STL, but leave me within the import area. Next, I'm going to go back up a folder. And I'm going, I'm going to go into my hybrid abutment and custom abutment demo. So this was actually one that is an a abutment, um, but also on a tie base. But this one has an angled screw hole. And so the key thing about... Um, if you have angled screw holes, is you do have to have a uh, five-axis mill. Um, if you have a, like a screw tank crown and it, the, you don't have an angled screw hole, then it's possible um, to mill those on a four-axis. You may have some undercuts on the external surface that don't get milled, but you can't actually do it. Um, if you have an angled screw hole, then you, you have to have five-axis. So import that as a hybrid abutment as well. And then we have one more, which is the abutment. But in this case, the screw retention is actually in the design. And so this is a little bit different. Typically, you, know, you would think, OK, well, hybrid abutment. In this case, I need to import it as an abutment so that it recognizes that screw lip. Okay, so a couple other things that we see here. It has identified the screw holes with this green line. And let's just. And the red surfaces, it's actually sealed off those screw holes to prevent um, like the roughing actions and everything to go down in there. So those are temporary surfaces that will be removed when it gets to the drilling for the mm -hmm. screw hole. And on the two that have what we would call a top cap, it's identified the different um, angulation of that top cap. And that's what we're seeing with this arrow. Now, if you saw one of these arrows on like a, a screw tank crown, we would get rid of that. And I'll show you how we're going to uh, delete some of these curves. If they're either if they don't come in or if we need to add them, then we can do that. But the first thing I'll do before we get to that is I'm going to actually import a puck. Over on the top right, we can see that we would need at least a 14.29 millimeter puck. Um, since they don't make those, uh, you can get a 15, but I'm going to go ahead and do a 16. So I'm just going to click the plus to create a new puck. In this case, uh, because it's a zirconia, we have to put in a scale factor. Um, typically, that's going to be printed somewhere on the puck, uh, either the label or maybe even a screen printed directly on it. So let's say. Now, Evan, what would you do if you wanted to use um, use a disk that you've already used before? Like, like maybe you've milled a few units out of a disk. Like, you already have a, a 16 millimeter that you that you've milled a few units out of, and you want to continue on using that one. So, the software will store the partially used pucks. Um, right now, uh, I don't have a partially used 16, but let's say over here on the right, uh, with 22 and 25, we have um, a number underneath the used disk column. So, if I click that number. It'll bring me into my use pucks. So you can see here's one I was doing some engineering testing with. And if I click that, you, all these little cubes, that's what we milled before. And those are uh, the used area is saved in this um, blank. And when you import uh, your units and then pick that puck, it automatically nests them in these green areas. And it, it's actually already nested them so that when I hit the check, I don't have waiting time where it's actually like nesting it three-dimensionally but we'll go ahead and do a new one here put in my scale factor and then give it a name I like to name it after kind of whatever the material brand is and then you know if there's a shade put the shade in 
and then just put a number on it in case you've got multiples of the same kind. Uh, you can also put lot codes in if you want to lot trace your stuff. Um, I don't here because I'm not actually you know milling anything for that goes in the mouth, but uh, it's there if you want it. So I hit the check, it already automatically nested them. And if I didn't want to adjust any of the curves on these, then technically I'd be ready to go. And I could just go to save toolpath or start milling. But I'm going to exit out of this for right now so we can look at some of the optional things to do. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is go into tools. I like to hide the clamp. Um, so I'll go into show hide and then hide fixture. So now I just have the puck and the units in there. So there's a couple considerations um, first on a hybrid abutment that has a top cap like this, and that's placement of the supports. So if I click on the support, you can see when I click on it that a, a white line appears around the margin. So in most cases on these, that margin is going to be the widest point. And if I go left click and hold and drag below or above, you can see I start getting this kind of purple strip that's basically an undercut you know and what we're seeing here is when the tool is coming from the underside that support blocks it when it's coming from the top side the margin blocks it so you have to think about okay if i'm going to have material filled in here and if you do five axis undercutting undercut removal you'll get some of it but not all of it um and you have to decide, all right, do I want to be finishing on the emergence profile below the margin or on the top cap above? Um, if you're doing split file designing, you're going to want to put them below. Um, yep. Now, if you've got stuff that, you know, the, the tissue, the emergence profile is really important that it's exactly as it's designed, then you'd want to go probably above. Uh, we do have one quick question here, Evan. Uh, how do you guys store your pucks? So I store mine. I just put them back in the, the box they come in. Um, and if there's a specific number, you know, like where I did Veracore ZR Pro 001, I'll write the 001 on the outside. And then the label on the outside tells me it's Veracore ZR Pro. So then I know which puck it is. And then I just keep it on a, a shelf or in a drawer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think organization is the biggest thing rather than like the actual conditions under which they're being stored. Yeah. Is the biggest thing is just knowing like like labeling your pucks so you know which one's which. If I want to delete a support, I can just select it and hit delete. So I'm just going to put two on this one. Now on the screw tank crown, we can see this white line kind of follows what you would call the height of contour as it's placed in the puck. Same thing though, if I'm off that white line, I'll start uh, creating an undercut where I'll have to finish some material if I don't use five axis undercutting to remove it. Okay. So now um, if you're not on the 2019 mailbox, then you'll notice some differences in how these, what are called curves, these purple lines, how they are um, colored. Uh, in the previous uh, releases, they were all that same color, including, you know, including this green line, and the uh, prep line. Um, but they've done some things to kind of make it really apparent when uh, some of these surfaces and curves are not identified correctly. It's really easy to see when the color's missing. So um, in 2019 and, and you know beyond, the prep margin line will come in in this kind of like orangish red color. So you do want to see that. And then the screw hole axis will come in as a green line. And again, you need that or it's not going to identify that it's going to be uh, need to drill that hole. And then again, the red surfaces, they're temporary during the roughing and um, some of the initial finishing processes that just keep the tools from trying to follow down into that screw hole um, when they don't need to and it's going to come and drill them later. 
So let's say we had imported one and it didn't come in with some of these surfaces. So I'm gonna come into tools and then I'm gonna go to curves and surfaces and I'm just gonna delete these out so I can show you how to add them back in if they're not there. And so I just had, went to delete curves and surfaces and I'm gonna delete everything on this. While you're doing that, uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, sorry, this is on a Roland, yes. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we're gonna be, those are, Roland mills are the mills that we sell. However, Millbox is not necessarily Roland specific. Right. Uh, uh, Millbox, um, SimSystem has has a, a Millbox uh, versions for multiple different uh, mills. Um, also, uh, what is the minimum number of supports can you use that or slash that are needed? Um, you know, that really depends. Um, yeah. there's, there's several factors. The size of the, 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 the connector, A, is a factor. Obviously, the small, if they're tiny, you know, tiny connectors, you're going to need more than, you know, two, maybe even more than three if they're tiny. Um, the other thing is the weight of whatever it is that you are uh, milling. You know, something smaller may not need, you know, as many connectors, whereas something that's really heavy is going to need more. So it, it, it really just depends. Yeah, but tip, typically, as a general rule, um, I, I've as a general rule, I usually go with three. Um, so there may be some cases where three is not necessary, um, but it just you know it's it depends. Yep. Yeah. And if you do have to go, um, you know, a lower number due to position, like let's say here, I mean, ideally three would be good, um, but just the way that that emergence and margin are contoured, it makes it kind of hard to fit one in here. So what I could do is just click both of these supports. And if you hold control on the keyboard and then click again, I can select both of them. Mm -hmm. And then if I increase the diameter at the material with this slider at the top to three millimeters, now I've got two supports, but they're more robust and should be fine uh, to hold that um, while it's finishing. So now that I, I'm going to go back into the uh, curves and surfaces. So now that I've deleted those curves, let, I'll show you how you can add them back. So the first thing we'll do is detect the cylinder. So I'm going to click cylinder detection. And then I'm going to click inside the hole. And you want to click somewhere like where the hole is actually, you know, has its full diameter on the sidewall. Like not up here, but I want to click down in it. That gives it a better chance of correctly identifying the direction and diameter of that screw hole. So you can see now I have that green line. We're just going to inspect it real quick. That looks good. Make sure the axis looks like it's correct. Yep. I'm gonna, before we exit that tool, do the same thing over on this one. All right. Next, what we'll do is close off these cylinders by adding a uh, cylinder cap. So I'm going to go to the next tool over, add cap to cylinder. And the same thing with this tool, click kind of down in the screw hole. And you just want to make sure that with this surface, that you can still see that green line coming through so that it actually machines it all the way out. Uh, otherwise, you might be left with like a little lip of zirconia around this uh, screw hole entry. So the next thing we need to do is uh, put that prep line on there if it didn't come in. So I can, there's two ways to do that. One is to have it automatically try and detect it. The other is to um, manually draw it. And typically the major CAD softwares are going to output a, a additional file with the STL that helps the software with this. So one, your import time's reduced, and two, um, you get an accurate, you know, margin um, uh, definition. So, and but that's one thing to know about the the that prep line is it's not actually like if it was off a little bit, it's not changing where the margin is. That line basically tells it where's the outside, where's the inside, and where's you know, that margin because there's spe uh, specific finishing um, approaches and steps, as well as separating the roughing between the internal and external 
um, just giving us the ability to change how stuff's finished uh, on either side. Um, but it's not actually going to say, okay, well, we're going to take, you know, cut the margin a millimeter out, you know, to the side or something like that. So again, I'm going to rotate to the bottom. And then I'm just going to click this edge. Oh, oops, wrong tool. So let me remove that because we don't want this surface all the way up here because then you're not, your internal surface isn't going to get finished. We just want that blocking off the screw hole. So now I'll click margin line detection, click on the margin, and then just put in your margin line offset. Um, I leave it at 0.15 in here. Um, you know, this interface is going to be a little wider than that, but that's okay. And so it's it's put this in. Now, when you know, I was talking about that file that will assist the software when it's importing and defining this um, in three shape. That's called the PTS file, and on most uh, manufacturing processes, it is output by default. You just want to make sure that if you're not importing directly from your manufacturing directory, uh, if you're transferring files, make sure you transfer that file with it. Um, in ExoCAD, it's the construction info file. Um, so you want to transfer that as well um, mm -hmm. with your STL. So, you know, that one it was quick and the um, auto um, detection uh, did a good job. So let's say I either the auto detection didn't do a good job and I think I can manually define it better then I can click manually draw margin line. And then I'm just going to start left clicking. and drawing. And then I specify the width and it follows that line. Nice. All right, so here we could go, now that those are defined, we could actually go calculate our job. So I'm gonna go in and anytime I'm doing something that's kind of, you know, probably not these, but something that's more complex, like a, you know, all on X bridge or something, um, I'll, I always save the toolpath and then output the whole toolpath later. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, if there is an issue with the calculation, you find out about it before it started cutting into your material. Um, and typically, if there is an issue, you can contact your reseller and um, they can help you know, make a little tweak to get around the issue. Um, and if you do that before it's cut into the puck, then even if it can't be fixed and a new job has to be made or the position changed, then you haven't compromised any material. However, if you do the start mill, this will start streaming uh, as soon as it calculates the first step out of the you know strategy list, it sends it to V panel and the mill starts milling. Um, and then as it calculates them, it it sends them out. Um, but there's a couple things issues that you can you know run into doing that. Uh, the, the biggest one, especially what we see, is people start the milling process and then their mills off and they walk over and turn it on. And what happens is the the roughing calculations are calculated pretty quickly um, and those calculations will get ca uh, calculated and sent over to vPanel before you get over there and turn your mill on and because of that vPanel there's no mill on so vPanel just kind of ignores it and what will happen mm -hmm. is the first step that actually gets on the mill is usually a, a finishing step you're gonna so bust the, mill the tool goes over and picks up a one millimeter and goes to start finishing a puck that hasn't been roughed in and you snap a tool yeah um, it's a bad day yeah. The other thing that can happen is, again, say um, you're it, streaming it to the mill and something in one of the later calculations you know, doesn't calculate right. Um, and so that could be, say, past the you know half of the finishing. So it roughs it in, it finishes it, and then the mill or V panel does all the steps that it received, but uh, say the calculation didn't actually, because of some issue, didn't 
get all the, the steps to vPanel. And you come in and look and it's oh, job's done. You take it out and it hasn't finished like some of the internal surfaces. Well, if you've taken the, depending on which mill it is, if you've taken the puck out of the machine or out of the adapter, then it's not going to go back in the exact same way. So that's just wasted material. Um, and, but if you save the toolpath first, any of these things you would see before you output it. The only thing is you got to wait uh, for it to finish calculating before you output it. And on older hardware that could, and especially if you've got a full puck or a lot of external undercutting uh, on like a all on X bridge, that could be a while. For instance, if I do five axis undercutting on a 12 unit all on four bridge on the, my actual computer, that's a, it's about a five year old three shape computer. It takes about 50 ish minutes to calculate. Now the one I'm running on now is a computer that we built uh, recently that um, has a Ryzen 3900X in it. So uh, the nice thing about Mailbox is it'll eat up all the available threads that it can um, to uh, calculate. So you'll see this is gonna be a lot faster than if we did it on my computer. And just for reference, you know, th that exact same job on our newer computer is, I think it was 12 minutes instead of 50. So it's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. That reason to keep your hardware up to date. <laughs> yep. So because I'm using the uh, DCI that has um, a disc changer, I need to tell it what adapter this puck would be in. So I'm just going to say, let's say it was an A. And I'll hit the check. Now I have to pick the kind of finishing that I want. Um, and depending on what's actually in the puck will determine what actually shows up in this list. Um, so the top two, this is going to be internal finishing. And I can either do three plus two. So three plus two finishing, um, what that does if, uh, on a five axis mill, you have th the three axes, that's X, Y, and Z. So your linear ones. And then um, your plus two would be axis A and axis B. Uh, on rolling mills, A is what turns the puck over and B is what tilts that whole uh, puck adapter forward and backwards. Um, and then again, the three is the X, Y, and Z linear. So what three plus two does is it will analyze the undercuts and it will position A and B, the plus two, so that there it eliminates the undercuts and can do just three axis machining. Um, and that's most common, like for the internal cavity finishing, that's more common to use than five axis. Uh, but what five axis simultaneous does is all five axes are moving at the same time. So, so what's a scenario where you might want to use one over the other? Or like um, what are the what are the pros and cons to each? So on the internal finishing, the times that I've found that I might go, you know, up to the five axis simultaneous would be like a um, like a shell temporary where I haven't had it virtually block anything out. It's just like a minimum thickness where you'd actually kind of have like an, an undercut kind of like that inside. Um, external mm -hmm. undercutting. I mean, I, I use the five axis simultaneous most of the time when I'm doing a, um, like an all on X that has tissue on it. Uh, I just think it, it gets a little bit yeah. a, a better finish, but it is, it will, the calculation time's a little longer, I think, in my experience, just because mm -hmm. it's a little bit more complex of a calculation to make. Yeah. Um, so if I wanted to, I could throw on external undercutting five axis. Um, so that would clean up a little bit under these, uh, in between the margin and these supports. Um, and the, the difference here between like the five axis automatic and five axis manual uh, with the, if the manual option, you actually use a, one of the extra tools and select the area where you want it to uh, remove undercuts. Um, whereas with automatic, it's automatically analyzing the surface. And then based on whatever is specified in the strategy will determine the max angle that it'll try and um, remove undercuts with. Secondary anatomy detail. Uh, there's an option if you want to have a 0.3 millimeter tool um, with the default rolling strategy that will uh, only be used on the occlusion where necessary. So basically anywhere where a 0.6 millimeter tool couldn't cut the anatomy, it'll come back with a 0.3 and what, do what's called rest milling and remove that material. Just going to give you better occlusal detail then. Yeah. Um, and it, 
it won't use it if it doesn't need to. So it, it analyzes the surface and determines if it needs to use it. But um, if you don't think you're, you know, that it'll use it, then I would probably leave it unchecked because it's just adding calculation time if it's not going to. Yeah. Um, remove rest material inside the cavity. That's similar to what this does, but it uses the 0.6 on the inside to say, okay, well, anything that, any radius that's too sharp for a one millimeter tool to finish, it'll come back in and do with a 0.6. Um, additional interproximal detail comes back and uses a different kind of um, finishing uh, tool path, just in the interproximals to make those embrasures a little more detailed. Uh, and then brush tool cleaning, if you want, that keeps the uh, the newer rolling mills have a brush tool and it'll come back and kind of sweep off the surface. Um, I don't use it, but I'll leave that up to any of you guys. So then I'm just gonna hit the check. And then as soon as it builds the uh, tool list, it's actually going to start calculating. Cool. Yep. That's pretty easy. Yep. So if there's any questions from anybody, just go ahead and throw them out there. Everybody's quiet today. It's Friday. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's ready for the weekend. Yeah, is, rainy uh, weekend here. Yeah. Is uh are all of you guys going are you guys back in the laboratory? Uh, feel free to comment. I'd love to I'd love to kind of pull the audience and see um if everybody's back to work or if you're still kind of shut down. Mark says every day every day every is day a day day right now. Hopefully that's going to change soon. I know a lot of states are starting to open things back up a little bit. So, so yeah, hopefully, Mark, that's going to that's gonna change. Kevin says, running skeleton crew about six hours a day. Yeah. Um, oh, we have one question. Uh, when would you use these square sprues, Evan? Okay. So, um, I mean, really, it, it, it's almost kind of a preference thing. Um, the nice thing about the square ones is you um, can actually get away with a um, like less, I guess, because it actually, depending on the size you end up making it, it it's a pretty strong, large uh, support. Um, and once we're done calculating here, I'll go in and show the difference so everybody else can see. Um, but in, in my experience, really, it, it's been more preference, maybe um, on, one of these, I could put just a flat one like underneath this margin and just have one. Yeah. Um, so what it's done here though, is it's popped up the tool table that's telling me what tools need to be in what slots. And these are using um, Roland's tools. Um, and these are the part numbers. So another nice thing is that if you have to replace a tool, you know what one you have to order. Um, in the DG shape strategy, it will use a, a two millimeter, one millimeter, and the 0.6 on everything. Uh, then in this case, it's using the uh, 0.3 millimeter tool. And these two flat tools are for cutting the interface on the custom abutments. So you do need the flat tools um, if you're gonna start doing these and, and you're using the roll-in strategy. That is one thing to say about Millbox, that, you know, depend, if you have it from us, we use the default DG shape strategy. Um, if you've been with us for a long time, then you probably remember back when we used to have our own strategy that we developed um, that we've stopped doing uh, for right now with Millbox, just because um, to customize the release of Millbox takes a little bit longer than it did with some 3D. Um, and, you know, really there's str the strategy addresses a lot more than ours did um, or did now. Uh, so, we can push out updates quicker if we just stick with the, the uh, default version. So it's already done calculating. And so you, you can see it calculated all that even though I hadn't closed the tool table. So we, if we want, we could look at a simulation. So you can see here in the residual material that it got some of that with the undercutting, but there's still going to be some material left around the supports, which is normal. Mm -hmm. But that's why you got to consider 
you know, where should these be? Now you can see on this one right here, I got some material in the screw hole. That's because when that red surface was put in, it was a little further down. You can see that this green hole or green line barely penetrates past that. So basically when it detected the screw hole, it was a little short of where it should be. And so I can go back and change that. And this is why it's good to look at these kind of simulations. Um, if I go back to tools and then curves and surfaces, then I have an option to change cylinder size. So I can click that and then click the, the green line. And let's just put it at like 7.1. And you can see, let me see, uh, change my view, you'll be able to see a little better. I'll make it. So if, when I go to 7.8, you can see that green that came lower down. So that's mm -hmm. basically where it's going to stop with that screw hole. Let's just see how this one looks. So Deborah says, we will be back with full staff Monday. Had several doctors open this week, but majority will be open on Monday. That's awesome. That's great news. Uh, another person says, I'm in the lab for reduced times and expect to be, expect to increase that in a week. Good. I'm really glad to hear that everybody's starting to starting to hopefully pick back up a little bit again. So that's that's, that's reassuring. Yeah. All right, give me one second. I was running that through remote desktop, so let me log back in. All right. Okay, so now, just real quick, I'm going to get rid of the two that are okay, just to make the calculation faster and show you the difference in increasing that screw hole length. And real quick, we'll just make sure that that stayed after I reconnected. So now if I back up, save toolpath, leave it in the same adapter. It's pretty quick. Yep. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and get those in. So Evan, what would have happened um before so before we change the height of that the the cylinder detection 
Mm-hmm. Um, what would have would it just not have milled out the screw channel, or would it yeah, have left like a little bit there? It, on the case of this one, um, it would have actually left like a real thin, just the, the screw hole closed like off. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's not the end of the world if that happens. You could, in the green state, punch it through, but you know, ideally, we don't want to do that. You yeah, know, don't ha- want to have to do that. So. So you can see now with that extension, it's gone. It's mm-hmm. gone. Um, so, and and that was quick. You know, I could have, um, before I did the calculation, kind of looked and and I did see it there. Um, but I want to be able to show you how to correct it. Um, if you just barely see that green line poking through that red surface, then I go in and extend it first, and then you don't have to worry about check well. I'd still check the simulation, but you still don't, you don't have to necessarily go back because it probably should take care of that. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, a side note, not necessarily about, you know, hybrids, but just milling in general, if you were to see like one whole side of this crown in like orange or blue or or green, basically any color that's positive in this scale, that means that the finishing for that side wasn't calculated. Um, and potentially the roughing as well. Like if this whole hole is filled in uh, in blue, then it just and usually what would cause that is you, that red surface that blocks off the screw hole is all the way up here at the um, the margin, and that that surface isn't is not removed until the drilling step. And um, so basically all the normal steps that would have finished a rough down in here, just they ignore it because they say, okay, there's nothing there for me to do. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you see something like that after the fact, after it's milled, um, you know, if it's the, if you haven't taken it out of the mill, then you can contact your support and typically they can, we could, you know, go back in. In the case of if it's just the red surface, you could go back in, delete that, you know, correct it, recalculate, and then output the job and let it uh, remill it and it would mill off the areas that it missed. Let's see, we had a question. Can we mill these with? The 51D Roland, yes. You can mill these with any of the Roland mills except for the DWX4. Well, so you could, as long as you don't have an angled screw hole, you could do them on the four or the the 42W. Um, but if you have angled screw holes or you know external undercuts, like in the case of the all on six with tissue, you have to have a five axis unless you want to be spending hours hand carving stuff. Um, so we had another good question. Uh, when do you use stabilizers and what type would you choose for zirconia? Okay, so real quick, let's go in and um, I'm gonna do a new job and I'll import one of those all on X bridges. Uh, so the general recommendation from uh, Roland and Sim Systems is if you've got seven or more units, then you wanna use a stabilizer. Um, the additional time I like to put them on is if I've got a lot of curvature to an arch because basically the stabilizer is just giving it support while it's centering to keep it from warping. Um, let me go up a level. Let's see. Into the screw chain bridge, ex- the sample folder. So for this, I'm going to import it again as a hybrid because it doesn't actually have the interface uh, that directly engages the implant. So the bigger the file and or the lack of that um, PTS or construction info file, the longer it'll take to do this initial import because the software has to do more analyzing of the surface. So any of those files that you can, you know, output with your STL, it's going to help.
We need some Jeopardy music going right now. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, something like a hybrid takes a lot longer to import than a uh, than just like a single unit. And so you can see here, um, and so part of the reason that this one took longer too, I think, is in the sample directory, there aren't PTS files. Actually, I kind of want to check and see. Um, I know in the past they weren't there. Nope, so they are here, um, but they uh, it's just a really big file to analyze uh, compared to a single. So for this, I need a, at least a 20. Let's put it in a 22. Let's look at this used one and see what we got. So here it's telling me it won't fit, so I'm obviously going to need a new one. So the object's red whenever the part border would be like intersecting either the clamp or closing, basically coming outside the puck where it's not going to leave enough room for that uh, initial roughing tool to get through there. Um, so of course, if you see that your object's red, you need to change the positioning. So if we go into tools and then into stabilizer, we have a couple different options. And really um, for me, the, the the type that I would use would depend on the centering furnace and the kind of the um, shape of the trays. So like in our original centering furnace, the trays were rectangular. So you couldn't actually lay this bridge down in there. So you would need to use one of the, like this first one, if I just click on the object and basically it has a platform. So you see this platform here, I could stand that up inside the tray, leave mm -hmm. the lid off and this would be sticking up inside the centering furnace. Um, now that if you've got some of the ones with round trays, uh, that the muffle height is not that tall, so you can't stand them up. So you would need to, you could still use this and lay it down, or you could use one like this, uh, right, this bar right here that just, uh, just engages that lingual side, but leaves all this material still in the puck. Um, so th that is one downside to these, at least this initial one. All this material right here is unusable. And it's going to rough all this down to get that thin support. Yeah. So that's a lot of extra milling time. Now there is this last option over here. That's basically the same thing, but it stays pretty much the thickness of the puck. So mm -hmm. you don't have all this just wasted time cutting it down. Um, and then the one in the middle actually is kind of cool. It has the same, you know, platform, you know, upright support, but you can actually nest units inside this area. So you actually use that material. Um, you probably want, you'd cool. want to cut them out before you center it, but um, that recoups probably the most material except for this one right here. Uh, that's just this bar. Um, but yeah, one like this, if you have a, a round tray, like our second gen centering furnace, then you can just lay it down. Assuming the round tray is actually big enough. Um, and with a stabilizer as well, you need to make sure, you know, it'll place some supports in between it and the bar, but you need to place some on the outside because if we just went with this, there's only one holding it to the puck and it's going to fall out. <laughs> so just click the object and then click the plus. And then just wherever our mouse is, we can add some. And on these, I like to go like on every other tooth or so. And then we can't forget about the 
like say lingual side of the support we got to have stuff in here as well and so that would be sufficient for this um, if you want to move supports around you can just click them so they're white and then move it hmm. And then from there, start mill, save toolpath, pick the adapter. Nice. Pick the finishing. So this is a case where I would use that five axis simultaneous external. Yeah. Otherwise, basically all of the area that's in the cervical third of this whole thing is going to be filled in and you're basically recontouring it by hand. It's a lot of work. Wait. Yeah, more than likely you'll get frustrated by the end of it and just toss it in the trash and remill it. <laughs> yep. Cool. Let's get any of those last minute questions in before we wrap this thing up. Um, Bennett had some nice words. Thank you guys for continuing education with the series. Great to be learning during this time. You know, I agree. And, you know, to be honest, it's, I think it's helped us. Out. I think it's helped us out a lot too. Just keeping us um i don't know encouraged because you know i i know how 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 discouraging this whole situation has been for labs and, and doctors offices it has been for us too honestly um yeah. i think it's i think we've been just as discouraged so you know uh, we're we're really uh we're really grateful that we were able to do this for everybody and um honestly we're we're grateful that it that it's kind of kept our minds busy too uh it's giving yeah. us something to do and something to look forward to you know three days a week so um no thank thank you guys uh everybody for attending uh we've had honestly a uh, tremendous turnout the last you know however many weeks we've been doing these uh the the amount of people that have been attending these has been phenomenal so we're we're super grateful for that um yeah Quick reminder, uh, this this was recorded, is recorded um, again. So to access the recording, just go to the registration page where you were originally registered for the webinar. Um, and probably by tomorrow-ish, um, it will be uploaded and it will be available for your viewing leisure. Um, so yep. feel free to check that out. Uh, if you have anybody, any coworkers, or anyone else in, at your lab or office that uh, would like to check it out, uh, we encourage them to do so. Uh, next week, what do, we, what do we have coming up next week on the schedule, Evan? Yep. So if you go to uh, Whitmix.com and then training at the top, uh, all of our upcoming series are now posted. Uh, one little note that we, we are switching from GoToMeeting to Zoom, uh, just for some added benefit we get from that uh, platform. Um, so uh, this first section is, of course, this week. Um, now you'll notice that all the old ones have been taken down. They'll be back up on a brand new page uh, in about a week. So they're not going away forever. You can still watch the videos. We just needed a new uh, actual landing page to put all the recorded ones on. So mm -hmm. that's in process, but we, uh, you know, we have to have our web developers build that page. So it'll be about a week and then that'll be back up. And I'm sure they'll e-blast where you can find the recorded ones. Um, but moving forward next week, we kind of have a, a mix of stuff. We have um, Corey and Bryce talking about the VeraBuild printer. Um, we also, after that, have myself and Bryce uh, talking about Bellis 3D face scanning and integration with 3Shape. Uh, then on Friday, we have um, myself, Bryce, and a special guest, Brandon Smith from 3Shape, talking about what's new in the 2020 version. That's going to be a cool one. I, I would yeah, highly yeah. recommend any any three shape users. Uh, I would register for that because uh, there are some yep. serious uh, there are some seriously awesome uh, um, new features coming out in the next version of three shape. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, the the stuff you've seen and uh, when we've been doing three shape here during these trainings, that's all been on 2020. So I'm sure there's some things you've seen that you might want a little more explanation on. That's the the webinar mm -hmm. to do it in. Uh, the following week, we have Surgical Guides 101, where we'll go through um, toothborne guides and then uh, tips and tricks for printing them. 
Awesome. Then we follow that up with an RPD week, uh, all kinds of different RPD designs from traditional uh, cast metal frames to flexible RPDs and even a, a flipper. Uh, That's going to be a fun week. Uh, these, which can be nice. printed, well, technically that can be printed too. Um, yeah, that'll be a, that'll be a fun week. Yeah. Uh, then in June, following that, we actually have a series that's all on kind of the more advanced removable stuff mm -hmm. um, from like copy milling dentures um, to actually, so copy milling, like converting it a uh, denture to a, a hybrid bar, um, actually duplicating a denture, uh, Toronto bridge design, um, advanced denture design, um, and then custom impression trays. And then, you know, following that, we're always looking for topics. So if there's things you want to see, let us know. And if we can turn it into a webinar, we'll do it. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Good deal. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today uh, for our for our uh, weekly Hawaiian Shirt Friday. Uh, we uh, I do want to note uh, as we switch to Zoom, I believe one thing we're going to be doing is uh, Facebook Live. So um, I would love uh, if anyone wants to watch on Facebook Live. Uh, I'll be probably hammering out some comments there for everyone that wants to kind of interact real time with us. Um, so that'll be that'll be pretty fun. So uh, look for us next week. Uh, please register if there's any any uh, webinars that you want to be a part of. Uh, we'd love for you to register. So um, with that, thank you everybody. Uh, I hope everybody has an awesome weekend and um, I hope everybody has a good week next week. I think I think next week things are going to start really looking up for us. So uh, thank you everyone, and we'll talk to you soon. Yep, take it easy.